And a substitution mutation could be considered to be analogous to a misspelling, if you will, it, when you're dealing with a human language. And so a mutation essentially changes, a substitution mut mutation changes the DNA sequence that would comprise a gene. So let's say you have a, an A at a particular position. That A, let's say, gets changed with a, a substituted and replaced by a G. Now you have a mutation. You have a change in that sequence. And it turns out that when that happens, the codon that that A is part of is now going to be a different codon because you replace the A with a G now. It's a now a new coding triplet. And that means that it could potentially specify a different amino acid. If it specifies a different amino acid, that means the amino acid sequence now that's used to build that protein is going to be altered. And because amino acid sequences dictate the structural folding of that protein chain, the chain may, may fold in a different manner. And, it, and, and that if it folds in, a, in an improper manner, it's going to compromise the function of the protein. And this is why mutations oftentimes are harmful or deleterious. It's because the mutation alters amino acid sequence, which alters the way the protein fo fo uh, folds and alters the protein's function at the end of the day. So mutations are not necessarily good things. <clears throat> and you can think of this, again, as being like a misspelling. Uh, that if you have C-A-T and you replace the A with a B, you now take a word that has meaning and generate molecular gibberish. And this is the same thing that can happen with mutations. You generate molecular gibberish. It turns out that the genetic code is structured in such a way that the redundancy in the code allows uh, for these mutations to occur without any negative consequences more often than not. In other words, the coding assignments are such that if you, if you replace one code, or sorry, if you, if, if you, if you alter the structure of, a, of one codon, you wind up generating many times a codon that will specify either the same amino acids because of the redundancy in the code, or an amino acid that has very similar chemical and physical properties. And this dampens the harmful effects of the mutations. And so this looks like there's an elegant set of rules that define the code. Uh, and it turns out that a few years ago, a team of scientists quantified the error minimization capacity of the code, and they showed, compared to 10 of the 18 randomly generated genetic codes, that the code in nature is highly anomalous. It's highly unusual. It's an outlier, where this would be the distribution of the error minimization capacities of the random codes and this is the error minimization capacity of the code found in nature. The lower the number here, the better the error minimization capacity. This code, the code in nature, seems to be highly unusual in its error minimization capacity. It seems to be optimized or fine-tuned to minimize error. And in fact, the code that's found in nature is universal, meaning that all life forms on Earth have, in essence, the same genetic code. And this is what Simon Conway Morris in his book Life Solution says about the genetic code. The genetic code found in nature displays eerie perfection and startling evidence of optimization. And if we go back to our story again, it's not just simply that the pilot recognized that there was information on the sh shore and radioed for help. It's not that he recognized that that information existed in the form of a code, which again implied a mind, and he radioed for help. It's that when he looked down the shoreline, he saw a thatch hut with a fire burning, which is further evidence that there was a, a human being on that island that needed help, that needed assistance. Likewise, the optimization and the fine tuning in, in terms of the, in the structure of the rules of the code provide further evidence for the work of a mind. So it's a three-tiered argument, in, in essence, that a mind must be responsible for uh, bringing uh, life into existence because, again, the genetic code is, at its very essence, biochemistry itself. And this has led scientists to conclude that the genetic code could not be a frozen accident. And this was an idea that essentially Francis Crick developed or advanced in the 1960s and persisted for about 30 plus years as the prevailing view, that the genetic code must be a frozen accident. And the reason why Francis Crick argued that way and why biochemists accepted that argument is because you cannot evolve the genetic code in any substantial way. Because if you start to evolve the genetic code, I'm not going to get into the details as to why this is the case, it's absolutely lethal. 
the cell cannot tolerate an evolving code because it, it will become absolutely catastrophic. Therefore, Crick argued that once the code was put in place, it was frozen in place and it could not even evolve further. And it was just simply a frozen accident because there's no way that nature could optimize or fine tune the code because it can't evolve. But yet we see that the code has evolved, or, or sorry, we see that the code is optimized. This has led the scientists who made this discovery to, to argue that the code must have evolved. But again, this is again uh, 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 unsupportable in light of what Francis Crick argued, because I think the thrust of Francis Crick's argument is correct. But compounding that problem is the fact that there's not enough time for the code to evolve. Because natural selection would have to sort through 10 to the 70 different codes to find the code in nature that is a highly unusual, highly optimized code with regard to its error minimization capacity. And given how much time is available for the origin of life, you would have to basically look through 10 to the 55 codes per second to find the code that's in na that, that exists in nature as a universal code that is exquisitely optimized. In addition to that, the genetic code's origin appears to coincide with the origin of life. So we don't have enough time for the code to evolve, and even if, the, even if you gave the, the genetic code the entire history of the universe, there's not enough time for the code to evolve. Again, you'd still have to look through an enormous number of codes per second to find the code in nature. This is evidence that I, this is a, a devastating blow, I would argue, to an evolutionary view of, of life's origin. Now, in addition to that, there's something else that's quite intriguing. That DNA not only has the genetic code that's embedded into its structure, there is a whole host of other codes that operate independently of the genetic code that overlap with the code and carry out, again, critical functions, and they work in conjunction with the genetic code. So in other words, it's as if you had a sequence of, of, of letters, and the way in which you made sense of those letters was, again, through the use of a code that decoded that, that sequence and gave you meaningful information. But at the same time, you had another set of rules that could take that same sequence and give you a different set of, different set of information, and then another set of rules that could give you even a third set of information from the same sequence to build a sequence that could harbor overlapping codes that would simultaneously communicate radically different things is incredibly amazing and would require an unbelievable amount of intelligent input to accomplish. And the, in addition to the genetic code, there's a number of other codes that you see built into the structure of DNA. Uh, I'm not going to go in, into the details. Uh, I was going to talk a little bit about the histone binding code. I just want to kind of begin to wrap things up by pointing out that there's been some recent work done uh, that has actually showed that in addition to being optimized for error minimization capacity, the, 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 the genetic code that's in, found in nature is also optimized so that it can actually harbor multiple overlapping codes. So there's a different type of optimization that we observe uh, for, the, for the genetic code as well. So what I basically have said here, and again, keep in mind this analogy between what humans do with regard to information and what we see in the cell's chemical systems. I've argued that biochemical systems are information systems and that there is a code that structures or organizes or gives meaning to that, that information both of which imply the work of an intelligent agent. This is our common experience. The genetic code displays remarkable optimization. That implies the work of an intelligent agent, independent of the information content. Uh, the genetic code's origin coincides with the origin of life, meaning that there's not enough time for the code to evolve. And even if there was enough time, given what Francis Crick argued, there's no way that the code could evolve. There are overlapping codes that exist within DNA that implies the work of an intelligent agent, and the genetic code is optimized to harbor overlapping codes. That implies intelligence. So what we can see is that there is a, a accumulating weight of evidence just from the structure of the genetic code and the information makeup of living systems to argue for the work of a creator and to argue against an evolutionary explanation.